you know, you, I started getting comfortable with saying I don't know. It's a really, really difficult th thing to say that, well, I don't know. Um, but uh, there's a big temptation to, instead of say I don't know, you say God did it. Right? So usually when I hear the terms now, God did it, you, to me I translate that as well, okay, you don't know either. We don't know. So before the discoveries of evolution, before the Big Bang, before uh, you know, heliocentrism, that you know, the, 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 everything revolves around the sun and the you know, structure of DNA by Watson and Crick, before all of these landmark discoveries that happened in just the last you know, couple of hundred years, um, these gaps were huge. They were massive. And, and yes, before this, many of the scientists themselves, the most scientists nowadays are not religious. Uh, you know, they're, they're not believers. But before evolution and before all of these, uh, these other ideas, uh, many scientists were. Isaac Newton was a very religious man, and many other scientists were as well. But uh, because of these, these gaps in our knowledge were really, really big, they were gaping, uh, well, they were massive gaps. Uh, but today, they are more narrow. Right? So uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's an astrophysicist and a science educator, uh, he put this really eloquently when he said that, you know, God, over time, he's an ever-receding pocket of scientific ignorance that's getting smaller and smaller and smaller as time moves on and as we, as we discover more and more things about the world and the nature and, and about nature and, and the objective reality that surrounds us. So, my big problem with the God of the Gaps issue, the, 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 the claim that God did it, is that it kills human curiosity. It's a, it's a very difficult thing. Uh, I see this, I saw this a lot growing up in Pakistan. You know, you're born, uh, in, from the day of birth, you're, you're told that, you know, all of the answers that you want, they're all in this book. You know, what is the incentive now to look for things? You see people making the same mistake over and over and over again because they don't really learn from their experience or their observation of the world around them. They just keep going back to what the revelation is and, and what what they consider to be divine truth. And um, you keep on saying, making the same mistake over and over again, and there's no personal evolution. Um, and speaking of evolution, I eventually grew to, I, I couldn't share this idea that, uh, that, that you talked about um, here, and it was, a, and thank you for that. I, I only got the, I saw only part of your speech and I heard the panel, so um, again, it made me think, but I, I disagree. I, I, I can't reconcile uh, faith with uh, the reality of evolution anymore. This is something that I, I did think uh, one of my um, sort of scientific heroes is a man named Francis Collins. Um, Dr. Collins is, you know, he was running the Human Genome Project uh, for a time. Uh, he uh, did a lot of work on, on the gene for cystic fibrosis, and he's a believer. So he, he's a phenomenal scientist. He was actually uh, one of the consulting physicians for Christopher Hitchens, who's one of the most sort of, uh, uh, I guess one of the most militant anti-theists uh, ever. And they, they became very good friends because he treated him when he was in his last stages of esophageal cancer. So uh, Francis Collins, I still have a tremendous amount of respect for him, but he actually thinks that uh, scientific, uh, the, the theory of evolution and religion, in his case, Christianity, are completely compatible. And this is also a view that has been, uh, you know, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, he had the view of, uh, uh, he, he wrote about non-overlapping magisteria, the NOMA, um, as it's known, NOMA, and he said that because they dealt with different modes of inquiry, science deals with facts, and religion deals with values and spiritual meaning, um, there is no overlap. They can exist in their own spheres. And it's a beautiful idea when you think about it, because you know, who doesn't like coexistence? It's very nice. But that doesn't mean that it works. It doesn't work that way. Now, did science, and this is what I said, does science, the topic here is, science, can Islam and science coexist? It obviously does. We have Islam in the world, we have Muslims in the world, and then we have science. The whole world runs according to science. I, they can clearly coexist. I just don't think that they're compatible. And I, I don't buy this uh, Noma idea or Francis Collins's belief anymore. Uh, number one, because it's clear that many of the claims that are made by religion, again, creation of the universe, claim by religion, 
uh, virgins giving birth, Jesus being resurrected, uh, animals that are, you know, the big flood comes and a boat saves animals, and, you know, no matter how metaphorical it is, uh, all, all of these things are not religious claims. These are scientific claims. You can put them to the test, right? So it's not a separate sphere. It's not, not non-overlapping. I mean, these are things you can actually find out about. Can a virgin give birth? How was the universe created? These are things, these are questions that we have answers to or partial answers to, and we're continuing to research and find more information on. These are, these are not religious claims. They're scientific claims. And uh, to me, the, the one claim that was a deal breaker, and yeah, this is after you study evolution, and this is something, a question you come across, and it's very, very, I, I think that if you truly study and understand evolution, you can't get past this, is this idea that Adam was the first human being, or that there was a first human being. And if you truly, again, understand how evolution works, you know that this can't be true, because, because Adam never existed. You know, there was never any first human being. Now, how is this possible? As human beings, we can't comprehend the vast scale of evolution. When we're talking about hundreds of millions of years, right, billions of years, we can't comprehend the, the way that, you know, the, those kinds of time scales. So imagine this, you know, you have, you have a daughter, right, from the day she's born until she's age 18, you take a picture of her every single day. You take a headshot, take a picture just, uh, of her face every single day from the day she's born until her 18th birthday. And then just imagine that you take all those pictures and you put them on a shelf, beginning to end, just a very, very long shelf, right? and, and you put them all there. And then uh, I ask you to take out any two consecutive pictures. You take out the two consecutive pictures, she's gonna look the same. It's one day after the other. You widen the, uh, the, the gap between them, and I say, okay, let's take out two pictures six months apart, you'll see a little bit of change. Two years apart, you'll see a much more significant change. And as the time goes, you know, as, as, the, as the gap becomes bigger, you're gonna see more of a change. But day to day, you're not gonna notice any difference in the picture. And this is how evolution works. You know, from one parent generation to the next, um, every living thing that came from parents was in this, it was the same species as its parents. When we talk about the evolution of species, it's a retrospective process. We look back and say, okay, after this time period, this species evolved into this species and so on. That's how we do it. But it's not like, you know, you had, uh, um, what was it, you know, uh, Australopithecus and then suddenly you had, uh, you know, Homo whatever. Um, it, it doesn't, it, one species didn't give rise to another one over generations. Right? And this is, Again, I will, um, uh, here's, yeah, Richard Dawkins actually used this analogy uh, for this as well. Uh, he said, at some point, we cease to think of ourselves as middle-aged, and we start to think ourselves of ourselves as old, right? And this is something that spoke to me very personally, because, uh, <laughs> you yeah, know, middle-aged to getting old. And, but but it's, it's true, you don't go to bed middle-aged and wake up old. It's a gradual process. It's something that you say retrospectively. Well, you know, it was around this time when, when I started getting, getting much older. So I've met many physicians. I have uh, physician friends. One of them is actually an MD, PhD, and his PhD is in molecular biology. He's a Pentecostal Christian uh, from Nigeria, and he denies evolution. He's he, was a, he was a resident with me, and a, you know, when we were doing uh, a residency in, in, in pathology, so he's also a pathologist. He doesn't believe in evolution. We see argue about it all the time. He just compartmentalizes his brain. And these are very intelligent, very educated people who are fully aware that there is such a thing called antimicrobial resistance or the antibacterial resistance, which I, I think so you, you mentioned as well. Um, just that the idea that bacteria evolved to become resistant to penicillin right in front of our very eyes. And it's amazing when you find out the details. When you, when you realize uh, what the details are. Right? Penicillin has this, this, uh, this component in it called beta-lactam. And the bacteria that became resistant to it developed an enzyme in just, <laughs> it wasn't even that fast, it was just in a matter of years, 
called beta-lactamase that allowed it to become resistant, just destroy penicillin. And they, the, the penicillin wouldn't work on a lot of these bacterial strains. That is evolution. And it's happening right in front of our eyes. It is a fact. So, so these are people, I mean, that, that, this friend of mine who doesn't believe in evolution, the physician, he knows about this. He understands it. Uh, but there are many, I, I can't say many, there are a handful of very qualified, very smart scientists and doctors who deny evolution. Um, what do they all have in common? What do you think? Uh, very deep religiosity. Right? And, and a great example of this that I think everyone here will know is Dr. Ben Carson. You know Dr. Ben Carson? Um, the youngest head of pediatric neurosurgery in, in, uh, at, at, in John Hopkins' history. Like just a fantastic physician. If you watch his videos talking about it, the TV coverage of him as a physician, brilliant, really impressive guy. Right. He's an evolution denier. He calls evolution the work of the devil. Uh, he, is, uh, he says that the Earth's geological layers came about due to a large flood. All of these claims, it's, and all of those things exist with, with all of that brilliance. And this, again, is a very sinister thing to me about faith. When you, when you, have, when you think that faith is, is also a legitimate uh, a, a method to get to the truth, the, the process, uh, it, it can really, I, I feel personally, it can infect and, and just turn the minds of brilliant people often to mush. At least partially. Right? So, another thing they say, well, to falsify evolution, you know, what do we do? There's gaps in the fossil record. And we have all of these fossils, and then there's, we don't have any fossils for this, like, you know, two million years, or a few hundred thousand years. So, what, what, about, what about that? That's evidence that evolution isn't continuous. And the thing is, you know, real life, it just doesn't work that way. You never have a, a full video of every murder being committed. You have pieces of it, and there are gaps. You put the pieces of the puzzle together, and you make a reasonable conclusion as to whether somebody committed a murder or not. Um, that is how evidence works. And this is why, again, another thing in science, proof, the word proof is a bad word, a taboo word in science. It's great in math, mathematics, different, and I, perfectly legitimate, legitimate, but in science, proof is a bad word. They always say, evidence in support of. That is, a, that is the way that we talk in science. Right? So you, that when, you, when you go back and, and you look at evolution, these gaps, they don't disprove evolution. Now, what would disprove evolution is if uh, a gap in the, um, this is as JBS Haldane said, you know, is if you went to the Precambrian era and you looked at all the fossils there and there were some gaps, in that gap, you found the fossil of a rabbit, right, or some kind of mammal. Then you would know, you're like, okay, there's a problem. Now we have to throw out everything we know about evolution. We found a mammal in the Precambrian era. Let's go back to the drawing books. That is when, you know, you have a problem with it. But that has never happened. Not once. Everything that we've seen when it comes to the evolution, the fossil record, is completely consistent with what the theory was. And, and there are countless, countless fossils that have been found. So, um, I'm gonna skip ahead just so that, you know, yeah, so there's this whole idea of, uh, again, science answers the how questions and religion answers the why questions. Uh, so, this is a very, very common claim and it's not just among Muslims, it's, it's across the board. And I've deliberately tried to focus this not just on Islam, but on, on religion overall in general, and, and just the idea of faith versus science. And uh, people often, you know, they present this as a statement of fact. You know, science answers the how, how questions, and religion the why questions. Uh, but, and it sounds nice, again, it sounds very poetic, it's got a little, a little bit of symmetry to it, it's almost musical, uh, but uh, it's just not true. You know, it sounds like yeah, there's a space here for everybody, we can all get along. It's just not true. So religion doesn't provide answers. That's one thing. Uh, religion, for all we know, as far as we know, makes them up. We have no evidence that these answers are true. 
we don't, the amount of, how much evidence do we have for the claim that Adam and Eve were banished from the Garden of Eden, for instance? Right, that's how, or in, in the Islamic account, uh, that, that they were sent down to earth from paradise. And uh, the, this happened because Eve ate the forbidden fruit. So, how much evidence do we have for that? We have no evidence for that. I mean, this isn't an answer to anything. It's just a claim that has absolutely no evidence. It's, it's like hearing a rumor and saying, okay, I believe this, much less a rumor from a very long time ago. So, it, it, and this is very difficult for a scientifically oriented mind to understand that how could, how could this be equivalent? Oh, this is the, the why questions and the how questions. How, there is no equivalence, right? And if it said, so if you said that science answers the how questions, or tries to answer the how questions, and religion addresses the why questions, that is a, that's a more true statement. That's something I can kind of get behind. Now, it also isn't true that, that religion only speaks to the why questions. Uh, religion also makes very strong how claims. Again, the claims that how the earth came to exist, you know, how humans came into being, how women was crea were created from a man's rib and so on. Uh, these, we, we know for a fact that these claims are false. They're absolutely not true. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of evidence-backed answers for this. Uh, and the answers we have are because of the, thanks to science. Right? So, this, uh, never mind. So, it was, yeah, so it was tough for me. I think that these answers uh, were too lazy. Once, once you believe that a supernatural God uh, created all of these things, you come up with a whole bunch of other problems. Evolution, again, the idea, did, did God set the process of evolution in motion? Is evolution, you know, we talked about this, is it beautiful or is it, you know, a horrendous process? Now, I think it's beyond just the beauties in the eye of the beholder. I think the fundamental um, elements of evolution by natural selection are based on survival of species. And that survival is always, always, necessarily at the expense of other living species. Um, animals have to eat other animals to survive, they have to eat other living things, plants, whatever, to survive. Um, they fight for territory, uh, they have to, uh, they fight for mates, uh, they, uh, they forcibly uh, mate with the females to propagate the species. It's, uh, uh, most of it, it's the might is right attitude, right, the, the whole, you're basically getting power by force. Yeah, the weapons race. It is essentially a weapons race. So it's a good example of the weapons race is the cheetah and the gazelle. Right, so you have cheetahs that run after gazelles because they have to eat the gazelles to survive. The gazelles have to run away from the cheetah because they have to not be eaten to survive. And with evolution, this is the kind of process that evolution is, that with evolution, uh, every generation of cheetah over generations, the cheetah gets to run faster so it can survive and cast a gazelle. And, and throughout the, gener the, 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 the the gazelle, with evolution, has to run faster to escape the cheetah. This is sadistic. You know, what you're doing is you're, you're taking two species and you're making them fight with each other. It's like when, when the U.S. was selling weapons to both Iran and Iraq at the same time. Was that the counter affair? And it, it, it's like that. And it's... it's if human beings did it, if governments do it, we think that this is sadistic and it's evil. But this is the nature of evolution. Evolution is not a pretty process. It's not a beautiful, there are many beautiful things about life. We're alive, we see the world around us, and yes, we can, we can sit here and we can you know, in, enjoy, we can see a lot of beautiful things. I, I, for example, I can see beautiful things because of my contact lenses. I'm almost blind. My prescription is like minus 6.25, minus 6.75. Without my contact lenses, I can't see anything, or my glasses. Um, and this allows me to see the beauty in life and nature. But the thing is, you know, a few centuries ago, a few millennia ago, I would have been wiped out. I would have been blind. I, the, when we lived in the might is right world, um, there's some wild animal that would have just come and eaten me. I, I wouldn't be here, you know, doing this talk and annoying everybody. So. So this is, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think it's as easy as, as saying that, you know, the beauty is if you see it or if you don't. I think very fundamentally the processes that drive evolution are, 
are really, really rough and really, really troubling. And, and we have done as human beings you know, things to try and, and, and mitigate that. Now, but in closing, I want to go back to the beginning. I just wanted to say that sentence. Uh, it's fine. The, the, for me, uh, it's the same thing that, you know, did God start evolution? The other question, now this is really what, what, was, what the turning point for me was, is did God start the Big Bang? Right? Why can't you believe both? Yes, the Big Bang theory, yeah, it's completely legitimate, uh, but uh, you know, God started it. Evolution is completely legitimate, we believe in it, but God started it. Now, with the Big Bang, this is something that kind of kept me holding on for a very long time. Because people would say, no, no, we've got the theory, the Big Bang theory. And I would think, but who started it? What happened before the Big Bang? That was a question, and that's why I held on to There were, there were times I kind of, I didn't really believe in Islam, I didn't believe, but I really did believe that there was a God that, that created everything because there had to have been, right? There had to have been a first cause. So the problem with the, with the first cause, right, is um, the same problem with the non-first cause is if that, you know, if uh, the universe was created by God, then who created God? If the universe is so magnificent and amazing that it must have had a creator, that creator must be even more magnificent and amazing. So that must have a creator. Would well, they say, well, no, that creator doesn't really need a creator. So why does the universe need a creator? You know, by, the, by the same argument. So that's a, that's a pretty classic argument, uh, but it's, there's, a, there's a problem.